to the scripture, hold it up like this, hold it up like this, everywhere over the, the, the floor, here we go, everybody together, this is my Bible, God's holy word, a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. It's inerrant. It's infallible. It's authoritative. It's more powerful than a sharp two-edged sword. It is fire shut up in my bones. I must speak it. It is food for my soul. I'm ready now to receive it. Turn with me to the last book of the Bible, chapter 21 of Revelation. We finished this uh, series. Dave thought he finished it last week, but I told him he wasn't done yet. <laughs> so we want to look at chapter 21, verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he, said, he who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give, to the fountain, I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who is thirst. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the cowardly and unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Father God, thank you for your word today. Thank you for your people. Thank you for the joy and the love that just... Uh, emanates from, from this congregation and lifts the incense of prayer to God. We thank you that your people, your family, your uh, body, Lord, is here, and we uh, uh, celebrate that body. We celebrate the opportunity to be in the house of God, worshiping you with one spirit, one faith, and in one purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, if you look in your uh, bulletin, you'll find an outline of today's Bible study notes. I want to begin with this paragraph taken from a book called Heaven, Your Real Home. Johnny Erickson Tata writes in her book, Heaven, Your Real Home. If you haven't read that, you'll enjoy reading it. She said, I'm an artist. Now, think of Johnny Erickson Tata as an artist. She's quadriplegic. She paints with a brush in her mouth, but a beautiful artist. She said, I have to confess, though, I've never succeeded in painting a picture of heaven. People ask me why, and I haven't come up with a good answer except to say that heaven defies the blank canvas of the artist. The best I can offer are scenes of breathtaking mountains or clouds that halfway reflect something of heaven's majesty. I'm never quite able to achieve the effect. Wow. Billy Graham tells about a little girl and her father walking out in the, in the countryside at night, and there's no headlights on the automobiles, there's no street lights, and then there's no lights coming from big buildings. Uh, it's dark, and all you can see is a velvet-studded uh, starry sky. So beautiful. And the little girl says to her daddy, Daddy, if the wrong side of heaven is so beautiful, what must the right side of heaven look like? Wow. Can you imagine 
fast forward just a few years, we're going to see the right side of heaven. And as good as that sounds, there is some scripture that I've chosen today that describes it in a little more detail than what I can. So I want to look at this fourfold description of heaven. A new heaven, it says. Verse 21, I, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. This is the location of heaven under point one, first description. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for a husband. When you look at the location of heaven, it is absolutely uh, astounding that we should see words like this. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. You know, we've got kind of used to this earth and the heavens. Uh, we see at night the best we can. And uh, astronauts that see it better. I, I kind of like this heaven uh, that, we, that is surrounding us and the earth that we live on. But it's, we're told here we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. Under A, a new heaven and a new earth presupposes that the old heaven, the old earth, is going to be renovated. Huh. Second Peter 3.10 says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, and the heavens will dissolve with a great noise, and the earth and the works therein will be burned up. Be burned up. Evidently, the old earth, the one we are in right now, is going to be burned. The heavens burn. So the burning is to purify, to renovate to revise, to revive, to remake, to rebuild. The fire is a part of the new heaven and the new earth, the new building that is going to take place. Now, we know that there's a heaven right now. If you die, your body goes back to the ground and your spirit goes back to God. We know that. And the Bible makes it very clear in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that when Jesus comes, he comes with the saints that are in heaven with him. He comes this way, and then the dead in Christ shall rise first, and they shall be caught up to meet them in the air. What in the world are we looking at? A twofold resurrection. The body or the spirit reuniting with the body. Yes, your dust, your ashes are sacred to God. I would pay attention how I take care of it. I wouldn't just blow your ashes off into the sea. God considers them sacred, so should we. Amen? I'm getting into meddling, isn't I? <laughs> so the body and the spirit have a united or become a glorified body so that you're ready for a new heaven and a new earth. Now, where is that new heaven, new earth going to be? It says it's coming down from God. So, one or two things. <clears throat> it's either hovering or it's on this earth. Under B, our heaven will be on the earth. That's my opinion. For what it's worth, I think it's the right opinion. Because under C, Alexander McLaren agrees with me. He agreed with me over 100 years ago, but he agreed with me. It seems to me that some cosmical change having passed upon this material world in which we dwell and its regenerated form will be our final abode of redeemed humanity. That, I think, says McLaren, is the natural interpretation of a great deal of scriptural teaching. That the new heaven, the new earth, will descend upon this earth. <coughs> you say, well... <coughs> there's not enough room for it. Did you not read in verse 1 with me that there'll be no more sea? How much of water covers our earth? Three-fourths. No sea, a lot more room. I believe it's going to be upon this earth. After this earth is purified, revived, revised, uh, rebuilt, remade. In Revelation 21, 2, it says, 
that the new Jerusalem is coming down from heaven as from God prepared as a bride. That new Jerusalem is the holy city in the new heaven. Now, the new Jerusalem is not the bride. It's the inhabitants of the new Jerusalem that's the bride. That would be you and me, assuming that we are born again, washed by the blood, and adopted into the family of God. That, my friend, is the bride of Christ, inhabited, in, 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 in housed in the new Jerusalem, the holy city, prepared as a bride. Now, I tell you what, I've seen a lot of pretty brides. They're all prepared very well. I remember one bride that we married. She was the sweetest looking girl in the world, had at least a thousand or two thousand dollar dress on, and we were ready for the wedding. Prepared. When she looked at me with a tear in her eyes, she said, I got a problem. I said, What is it? She pulled up her dress. She had no shoes on. I said, Honey, you look pretty. That you prepared for this day, you will be the first bride to get married with no shoes. And she did, because she was prepared. She loved her husband, and she was dressed. She was decked out. I remember one bride said, right at the time of the wedding, I don't think I'm ready. I said, you don't understand. You prepared for this day. You're dressed for this day. I'm dressed for this day. I've dedicated this day for your wedding. We are prepared. She said, you think it'll work? It's going to work. We got married. Listen, God is preparing you. You don't have to worry if you're going to be prepared. You will be prepared. Now, some of you may have a little problem getting into that wedding garment. I'm just saying, you need to work on it or God will work on it. And I'm not talking about your weight. I'm talking about your moral character. You either shape up or he'll shape you up because he's going to prepare you, God's going to prepare you as a bride adorned for a husband. You and I will make up the bride for Jesus Christ. It is going to be a great, great day, that wedding day. Amen? Under Bible study note D, <coughs> the new Jerusalem will come down out of heaven prepared by God. Now, I like that word prepared, so I'm going to uh, just park there for a minute. Because Jesus used the same word, didn't he? He said, I go to prepare a place for you. To prepare a place. God is the ultimate engineer. He is the personification of the greatest artist of all time. He prepared the world we're in now. Amen? I think he did a good job. I think it's kind of beautiful even in the wintertime. I don't have to run to Florida to hide from his beauty. You weak, weeny people. Come on now. God made this place beautiful. And the Buckeyes won and things are looking good. He's prepared this place. However long it took him to prepare this beautiful world, he's had more time to prepare that place. And one day Jesus sent his disciples out on a mission trip. And man, did they have a good time. They came back and they were just rejoicing and they bragged how that the devil and the demons were subject to them, how that they healed the sick, how they preached the gospel to the poor, and Jesus said, okay, stop right there. Don't rejoice because the demons were subject to you or that you had uh, power to heal the sick or to preach the gospel to the poor. Rather rejoice because your name is written in heaven. What was he saying? He's saying, listen, no matter how good this world is, how successful you are, there's something much, much, much better. It's heaven. Now listen, you may have a big portfolio and a lot of money in a 401k. You may have the nicest car in the parking lot, which would be a pickup truck, by the way. They're eighty dollars to $100,000 a day. I'm just saying it's not like when I was on the dairy farm. You may have the biggest pickup truck 
and the most expensive car in the parking lot. But listen, no matter how good you're having it, it is not as good as what you're going to have. Rejoice whether your name is written in heaven. Amen. Rejoice because your name is written in heaven. So we look at the location of heaven. It's new. It's beautiful. It's prepared. Look at the size of heaven. The size of heaven in verse 3. Behold, the tabernacle of God. I heard a loud voice saying, a voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. Look under A, the tabernacle of God is with men. The house of God is full of men. Men will dwell with Christ. Using the word men, generically speaking, we're talking men and women, male and female, all of mankind that is born again, washed by the blood, adopted into the family of God, is going to dwell with God. It's going to be with God. They're going to be with him. He's going to be their God, and they're going to be his people, and that's the way it's going to be in heaven. How big that uh, heaven is going to be? Big enough. How many people are we talking about? We're talking about a lot of people. John said, I saw them on the shores of heaven, and you couldn't number the number of people in heaven praising God and worshiping him. Are you in that number? You will be if you're born again, if you're uh, washed in the blood, if you're adopted into the family, you will be in that number. Now, there's about 8 billion people in our world today. And if you want to see most of them, they're coming off of Route 71 South. At 4 o'clock Friday afternoon going on Stringtown Road, you can see most of those 8 billion people. They're there. But I want to tell you there's more than 8 billion. We're talking about those today, those yesterday, and those 10 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago that's been born again, washed by the blood, and adopted in the family of God. They are going to be with God forever. It's going to require something big. Under B, how large is heaven? It's a 1,500-mile cube. We read in 21.16 that the length is 12,000 forloins. And the width is 12,000 forloins. And the height is 12,000 forloins. How much is 12,000 forloins? 1,500 miles. So heaven... The holy city is a 1,500-mile cube. Now, wouldn't you know a mathematician would figure out how much that is? Mathematician figures that if you take a 1,500-mile cube, you can have 30 billion families, 30 billion families of five, and each one will have 594 square miles of living space. I think that's enough elbow room for you. Maybe not for Gerald, but for the rest of us. You know, we, are, we think too small sometimes. We think if we... There's a song that says, if I could just have a cabin in the corner of glory land. Well, God never wrote that song. When I, when I was young, I started a dairy farm, and I had a dairy farm that was doing great, so I bought another farm to go with it, and then I thought, I need more farm. I rented a farm to go with that one, and I thought... Now, I have just, I am a wealthy dairy farmer, tree farm. When I got that out of my system and sold that place and got on with better things, I realized I was thinking too small. God don't want me to have three little dairy farms. He wants me to have the world. It belongs to him. All the land, all the sea, all that there is. It belongs to my Father, and I'm an heir of God and a joint heir of Jesus Christ. Don't think small. Think big. Heaven is a big, big place. A big, big place. A big, big place. Wow. I think the mathematician probably got some uh, figures wrong because it's bigger than that. How big is heaven? Under C, it's large enough for the entire human race. However many that is. It's large enough. 
Why would it be large enough? Because according to 1 Peter 3, 9, 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish. So he made heaven big enough for everybody. John 3, 16, he loved the world. Not just part of the world, not just piece of the world, not just the Methodist, <laughs> not just those little Nazarenes. He loved us all. And he gave his son for us all to be saved. Listen, God intended for you to be saved. And I don't think it's easy to go to hell. I think it's hard. You've got to say no to God's love and God's grace and the cross of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ. And you've got to say no to all the prayers of God's people and all the invitations that people give you to come to church. You've got to reject, reject, reject Till the day you die to go to hell because God intended for you to be saved. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, listen, heaven is for you. Heaven is for you. The cross was for you. The blood was for you. Salvation is for you. It's for all of us. It's large enough for the whole world to be saved. Now, where'd my thing go? Every now and then you run into somebody who says, well, you know, I'm just too old. I'm too set in my ways. Or maybe, maybe I'm just not good enough. Several years ago, there was a fellow that was 83 years old. And I talked to him about salvation. He said, you know, I'm too old to change. I said, I don't think so. He said, I don't have anything to, left in my life to, to offer God. I said, it's not about you giving anything to God. It's about him giving something to you. Jesus died for you. He offers forgiveness to you. He offers salvation to you. It's about you receiving, not giving. He said, if you think so. I said, I know so. And with a tear in his eyes, he accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Listen, it's not too late for you. You're not too mean. You're not too bad. Jesus died for sinners. He didn't die for the righteous. He died for sinners. We're all sinners here. He died for you. So this man gave his life to the Lord, 83 years old. And so when it came time to baptize him, we were in our uh, church over in Kingston and the, the old auditorium upstairs had a baptistry that had a heater in it and sometimes it worked. It was in the wintertime, and, and it didn't work that day. And I told, uh, I told Mr. Fisher, I said, this water's cold. Now, there's a curtain between us and the church, uh, congregation, so they couldn't see us. I said, just touch it so you know. Oh, it's cold, he said. I said, you know what? You give your life to Jesus. He's in your heart. Jesus is going to take care of you, Brother Fisher. And I said, you'll never get sick because this water's cold. He said, you, th you sure? I said, I'm sure. So he got in that water, and he had just shivering and shaking, and the curtain was pulled, and he started squealing. I said, listen, people hear you out there. You're in church. And so he shut up, and they opened the curtain, and I did whatever I had to do and baptized him, brought him up. He was shaking. He let out a yell, a squeal. He said, this is murder. I said, Mr. Fisher, you're right. You've been buried in Christ and risen to walk in newness of life. If you have had an experience where you've been buried in Christ, you've been risen to walk in Christ, give him praise this morning. He's worthy. We look at the size of heaven. It's big enough for all. Pastor, you think everybody will get saved? I wish they were, but I know they won't. But it's not because God didn't intend it. Let's look at number three. The third description of heaven is the laws of heaven. The laws of heaven are in verse 4 and 5. And it says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. That's, that is a law in heaven. You can't get a tear in heaven. You can't see a death in heaven. You'll never have sorrow in heaven. There will be no more crying. There should be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. 
Then he who sat on the throne, behold, I make all things new. And he said, write, for these are the words of true and faithful. These are true words. There will be no tears in heaven. There will be no crying in heaven. There will be no pain in heaven. There will be no sorrow in heaven. There will be no sickness in heaven. There will be no death in heaven. Amen. Heaven is going to be a wonderful place full of glory and grace. One day I'm going to see his face. Heaven is a wonderful place. Listen, we need to realize this is a real deal. Just as this place is real, heaven is real. Just as if you've never been to California, you can believe this. If you haven't seen it, California real is real. If you've never been to New York, take my word for it, it's real. If you've never been to heaven, take Jesus' word for it, it is real. It's a real deal. The laws under A, the laws that govern heaven, will make that place the most happiest place in the world. There'll never be sickness. You'll never have a sad day. You'll never be depressed. You'll never be discouraged. You'll never gripe. You'll never grumble. Because you'll never have a bad day in heaven. Amen. Do you ever think God had a bad day in heaven? Can you ever believe that Jesus have a bad day in heaven? You'll never have a bad day in heaven. Amen. You'll never have a bad hair day in heaven. Tim. Lonnie. You know, uh, not long ago, some time ago, I was having a bad day. First of all, I went to the ATM, and it took my card and kept it. I talked to the teller. I said, I want my card. It's in your machine. He said, I can't give it to you. I said, you can because it's in your machine. He said, no, we'll have to mail it to you next week. I said, it's in your machine. <laughs> Sorry. So I left there and went to CBS. I stood in line. It must have been an epidemic. Line forever to get my prescription. Got up there. What's your name? What's your birth date? They know that stuff, but they asked me anyhow. And so I told them, they said, well, your doctor hadn't called in your prescription. I said, what? <laughs> so I left there, and I thought I'd get my wife some lunch, and I went to KFC. You notice all these acronyms? I went to KFC, and I ordered our lunch. I got out. I found I had mac and cheese instead of mashed potatoes, but I was already on Stringtown Road. <laughs> we had our lunch, and then I went to the BMV. I went to the BMV to get my sticker because one of Grove City's finest gave me a ticket for not having a sticker. $80 I donated to the city. A friend in the church said, well, don't worry about it. You only have to pay half for the sticker. So you only had the sticker half a year. I said, well, that sounds a little encouraging. I got there, told the lady I needed a sticker. She said, you have to pay for the full year. I said, why? She said, you've been driving a car the full year. I said, how do you know that? She said, you got a ticket. I said, I'm having a bad day. And nobody cares. There's not going to be any bad days in heaven, Gerald. Not going to be any bad days in heaven. It is the happiest place in the world. And Vance Habner, who was a great old southern Baptist pastor, Vance Habner said about heaven and B, it's the hope of dying that's kept me alive this long. And Tony Evans said, have a good time at my funeral because I'm not going to be there. <laughs> C.S. Spurgeon said, when you preachers preach about heaven, put a smile on your face, lift up your countenance, put a spark in your eye, but when you preach about hell, your old ordinary face will do isn't it about time we put a smile on our face? Are we going to heaven? Is heaven a happy place? Is it a big place? Is it a good place? Is it a beautiful place? There is nothing like heaven, amen? And God has prepared it for us. He prepared this place. He prepared that place. Lastly, the longevity of heaven. Now think about longevity. Under verse 6, and he said to me, 
It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Under A, there is no teaching in the Bible about annihilation. There are people who believe, people who sincerely believe that when they die, that's it. They just dissolve into the universe and there is no consciousness at all. That is not in the Bible. This is our authority. I believe it is the greatest book in the world. It is a book written for all time and all people and all places. And there is nothing in this word that talks about annihilation. When you die, according to the Bible, you will live somewhere in spirit and soul. You either live in heaven or you will not. C.A. Spurgeon said, on every chain in hell is the word forever. Forever, forever. And ascending from the bottomless pit is the echo. No appeal, no appeal, no appeal. The word that best describes this world under B is the word temporary. Everything here is temporary. This wonderful building, built to stand, will fall and dissolve. Those beautiful homes that you came from this morning, as much as you enjoy living in them, they are temporary. The money you have saved up will be gone. And the body we live in is not made forever. Look at it. But there is a forever with God. Heaven is forever. Your new body is to enjoy heaven forever. If you don't know for sure you're going to heaven, you need to know for sure. Because this is what matters. Who won the ball game yesterday? That's nice, but it doesn't matter. What matters is eternity. To know the Lord. Under C, in a cemetery in Indiana, on an old tombstone is this epitaph. It reads, Paul's stranger, as you pass by, for as you are, so once was I. As I am, so you will be. Prepare for death and follow me. Sometime later, a passerby scratched on that same tombstone these words. To follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> Does it matter? Does it matter? Does it matter which way you went? It matters. It's the only thing that matters. So about four weeks ago, I got this little walker. And I had so much pain, I could hardly stay on it for a couple of steps. And I want to tell you, if you're not married, men, if you're single, get married. <laughs> I don't think you're meant to live alone, especially when you're sick. I mean, my wife has waited on me hand and foot. I can't tell you how good she's been to me. So if you ever hear me say anything bad about her, punch me straight in the nose. <laughs> I'll deserve it. She's a peach. So second day in, I was bored and I wanted to do something. So I had her to help me get to the table and I started paying some bills. Only had two or three bills. The Coles credit card came up. <laughs> I didn't know very much. I think $30, $40. But they put a $27 late fee on it. These credit card companies. 
they give you 10% off, 20% off. You buy something and charge you 30% late fee if you don't pay it right on time. They send you the stupid thing when it's not time to pay for it. Time you get time to pay for it, it's late. So I called and talked to them nicely and told them to cancel my credit card. When I said that, my wife kind of turned green. I hung up the phone, she grimaced, and then she walked upstairs. You don't understand. When I was on this second day in, I couldn't do anything by myself. I was on a bed downstairs. I was taking baths downstairs. I was doing everything downstairs. She went upstairs. She shut the door. I was stuck. After a little bit, I yelled, and I said, Honey, are you up there? No, no sign, no sound. It was like steel door, silent. I said, Dear, I need your help. I'm down here. Are you up there? She never came back. <laughs> For three hours, she finally came back, and I said, I'm sorry. Get you some more credit cards, as many as you want. But I want to tell you, the second week in, as the second week ended and I turned into the third week, I was able to climb the stairs one foot at a time, one foot at a time. And the doc said, you're doing good. And I want you to know, I was made. I was born. I was prepared to be upstairs. <laughs> my studies upstairs. My big comfortable beds upstairs. My hot showers upstairs. I can't live without upstairs. Now, there was a poet who one time said, there's a highway to hell, but there's a staircase to heaven. And I want you to know, I got some loved ones up there. And every now and then I hear from them. I feel a tug on my heart that they're up there and they want me to come up. I'm not able to climb those stairs yet, but won't be long. Won't be long for me. And those stairs are going to be climbed and I'm going to be thankful. And in the words of a black, great black theologian, moving on up, moving on up. <laughs> to the east side. I got a deluxe apartment in the sky. Moving on up, moving on up. I got a piece of the pie. Amen. Oh, yeah. Let's stand for prayer. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior and you don't know for sure if you die, you go to heaven, I want to invite you to come to this altar and let one of these men pray with you and share with you how you can know for sure when you die, you go to heaven. You need to know that beyond anything else in your heart. You need to know for sure if you die, you go to heaven. If you don't know that, come forward this morning. Let these men pray for you and show you in the Bible how you can know. If you have loved ones that are not saved, why don't you just come and share their name with these uh, brothers and have them to pray with you for their salvation. You say, I've been praying. Let's pray harder. If you have some neighbors, some co-workers, that need salvation, come and pray for them. We got time to spend in prayer. And I don't know what any better way to spend our last few minutes than praying. If you need to be prayed for for healing, we will do that. Whatever you need prayer for, you come at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. John. Time together. Thank you for the word of truth and the hope that you give us of heaven. 
you promise great things and we have learned to trust your promises. Bless those at the altar and meet the needs of those that are lifting up petitions to you. Lord, comfort the hearts, heal the broken spirits, the broken bodies, and save those that are lost. Now may the grace of God and the love of Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with you now and forevermore, world without end. Amen.